right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Dan Seewald, your host. You probably know me and welcome to all you deliberate innovators out there today. You know, it's a lovely spring day and you know, I've got AI on the mind and you know, you might too, because you've been hearing probably a lot about it over the past several months. Maybe your kids wrote a term paper using AI, shame, shame if they did. Um, maybe you're using it, doing your copywriting or writing an email, or maybe you just were curious and you were checking some things out over the past couple of weeks. We are going to go into the deep end talking about AI, but not just about AI. We're going to talk about the ethical quandaries that are elicited by artificial intelligence. And I could think of nobody better to be able to discuss this with than my guest here today, S. Matthew Lau, or just Matthew. Matthew, so first of all, thank you for being here. It's a real treat to have you here. And uh, quite frankly, I mean, I can't think of any better topic to talk about at this stage, but thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me, Dan. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Well, you know, Matthew, I, I got to do uh, a quick service for you because maybe not everybody here knows you. I mean, I know you, Matthew. You're probably one of the most renowned bioethicists that I've ever met. But for those who don't know Matthew, I'm going to give you a quick backdrop about who he is. Matthew is not only a philosopher, not only a bioethicist, but he's also an author. He's internationally known for the variety of fascinating work that he's done that affects our daily lives from reproductive technologies, neuroethics, and of course, AI. Um, during the day, Matthew is the Arthur Zittrain Chair of Bioethics and the Director of the Center for Bioethics and Affiliated Professor in the Department of Philosophy at NYU, New York University. And Matthew's also the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Moral Philosophy. And in 2019, he was appointed as the Fellow at the Hastings Center, which if you don't know it, it's one of the most prestigious bioethics research institutes, so not too shabby. And, uh, you know, Matthew's been, has had his work discussed in many different places that you might have seen, The Guardian, The BBC, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Tucker Carlson, but <clears throat> we won't talk about that. Um, and Matthew's also had more publications than I can count, which is pretty high. Um, he's got a couple of books, The Right to Be Loved. He's cooperated on a bunch of other books, and he recently published The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. I mean, Matthew, I could keep going on, but you know what? We got things to cover today. So um, before I jump with my first question for you, Matthew, a couple of housekeeping notes for folks. First off, we're going to start out, and I'm going to ask Matthew a bunch of questions about AI, about bioethics, and so on. We're going to take a pause so you guys have your say. Ask your questions in the uh, LinkedIn chat feature, which you see there. So have at it and, and use that. Start putting those questions in right now, if you like. We will stop. We'll moderate those questions. So Matthew has a chance to directly answer them. If we don't get to all of them, don't worry. We'll, uh, we'll have a look afterwards and share some thoughts, answers, responses to you as well. Now, one more thing that I'll just note is that we will have a second part after the Q&A which is called, What Would You Do? All copyrights aside, we're stealing a little bit of the, the program from ABC where we're gonna ask Matthew, what would he do as a bioethicist with some interesting ethical dilemmas that you might see coming to an office or a household near you? So Matthew, you ready for that? I haven't told you anything yet, but <laughs> what, how you feeling about that? Uh, feeling great. All right. Good. Well, we have no zingers, but some interesting ones for you. Um, okay. Well, Matthew, let me just start off by asking this question. When I first told a couple of friends and family members that I'm going to be interviewing one of the most renowned bioethicists, they said to me, well, that's cool, but uh, what's a bioethicist? And I said to them, well, uh, you know, I'll describe it to you, but why don't you wait? And I'm going to ask Matthew to tell you what is a bioethicist? And uh, so maybe you could give me a little bit about what that means and what's your day-to-day -day like? Sure. Uh, so bioethics is the study of uh, uh, life's ethical issues arising out of life sciences um, and generally sort of uh, technology, sort of health care technologies, biomedical research, and so on and so forth. Uh, my day-to-day, -day, I'm, you know, 
usually when I get up, I try to scan the news. I try to see sort of what's coming online. What are some of the hot uh, hot button issues of the day? And then I go on. Then I have a bunch of different projects. Uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, right now I'm trying to write a book. It's called uh, it's it's neural ethics. Uh, so neural ethics is sort of uh, it's this, uh, there are a bunch of uh, novel uh, emerging technologies on the brain, and um, and I'm sort of uh, right now writing a book on that. Uh, and then I'll also prepare uh, my teaching. So I'm, you know, also teaching a course on neuroethics right now, a grad seminar. I taught it last night, and um, uh, and so that's roughly what my day's like. Yeah, I I, I got to ask you, going a little bit deeper. You mentioned there are some hot button issues. I, I feel like there's just. I, I wish we had like five hours to do this because there's so many topics I want to talk to you about. But um, give me a, a quick gallery view. What are some of the things that come up often that people are tearing their hair out about? Sure. So, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, you already mentioned one of them is going to be AI, sort of artificial intelligence. Uh, I recently uh, published an uh, edit collection on the ethics of AI, and that topic has just got it has just ex really exploded. So, you know, if you look at ChatGPT, everybody's using it. Uh, and you, uh, Dan's mentioned that, you know, um, there are all sorts of implications. So at my school, for example, we're worried about whether students are going to use this on exams and plagiarism. Uh, I've seen, uh, people submitting essays, uh, and, you know, where they use chat GPT, uh, you know, to my journal and, um, so, you know, these issues are already cropping up and the technology is only a couple months old. Uh, and so uh, there are even people who are calling for moratorium on sort of these uh, these technologies. So that's definitely one hot button uh, topic. And yeah, I can go on and list a bunch of other ones, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll drill. We're going to drill into some of these for sure. And I, I so let me, let me go just a little deeper, just about um, kind of bioethics and and some of the challenges. So w when you think about like. How you got involved as a bioethicist like how does one become a bioethicist and what kind of triggered you to to get involved i'm, I'm curious personally how did you end up in this station in life yeah uh great so bioethics you can actually do it in a bunch of different ways uh the way i got into it was through uh philosophy uh so i was uh, i was doing a phd in philosophy in england at oxford uh, and I was doing something called moral philosophy and just thinking about ethical issues generally. Uh, and there I discovered that there were a lot of uh, biomedical issues, things relating to abortion, you know, uh, reproductive technologies and so on and so forth. And I discovered this whole area of bioethics uh, where people were uh, interested in, you know, these new, te uh, new technologies. So things like end of life, how do we decide uh, when to let a loved one uh, go, uh, and so on and so mm. forth. So there were a, a lot of complex ethical issues that I encountered, and I just, you know, thought, hey, I want to spend my life doing, uh, you know, thinking about these very, uh, these questions that are really important to a lot of people, uh, and it seems like a worthwhile endeavor, <laughs> uh, you know, to yeah. be working on these topics. Yeah. And it keeps changing. It really seems like it keeps changing. I remember, you know, end of life issues. It was top of mind for so long, but now there is a lot of other sort of ethical dilemmas. Reproductive rights continues to be very, very top of mind, but we'll 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 come to that in a moment. But I, I want to switch back to AI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, personally, I'm going to probably estimate that I read about five to six articles every day. I'm not even exaggerating on artificial intelligence. Some of them are total garbage and some are mm -hmm. really, really insightful. I won't say who the garbage ones are, but yeah. um, everybody has an opinion, which makes it really intriguing. But let me start back from ground zero, if you will. Um, how do you define AI? I mean, we hear about mm -hmm. generative AI, narrow AI. There must be broad AI if there's narrow AI. Well, can you give me a quick synopsis or give folks a synopsis and then let's go deeper on it? Sure. Uh, so uh, there's really no generally agreed upon definition of what AI is. Uh, roughly, I take it to mean something like getting machines to do like sort of engaging processes like thinking, 
and reasoning that sort of, you know, if it, you know, that we do, that humans do, right? Uh, and there are sort of different forms of AI. So the old forms of AI, it's called symbolic AI. And that's just a bunch of, um, you know, you uh, basically say, if something happens, then something happens, you know, um, and that's, uh, you know, using symbols uh, and, and things like that. The new AI is uh, something called machine learning. And machine learning basically learns on its own. You get, get the algorithms to learn on its own. And there, and there are different types very quickly. There's something called supervised learning uh, where you supervise. Uh, that is exactly what it means. So you train the algorithm on certain data and you tell the algorithm which data is correct. And then it learns uh, by you telling it. And then there's something called unsupervised learning where uh, the algorithm just is able to sort the different data in the different piles on its own. Um, and what's really interesting is now there's something called deep learning and deep learning just basically involves uh, this sort of sorting on its own, but in a very complex way, there's a, a huge network of nodes. Um, and because of that, uh, because, it, it, you know, there, there could be millions and billions of nodes uh, where it's trying to figure out different things just based on sort of math and algorithm. And because of that, it creates something called a black box problem, where even mm. the engineers who are trying to uh, code the thing don't know what's going on. So it's unlike the symbolic AI, where the engineers know exactly what's going on because they put in the if then you know throughout the whole codes. Uh, in this case, the algorithm is doing that, and so the the you know even the engineers don't know uh, the you know what will happen uh, with uh, the algorithm. So that, that notion of supervised versus unsupervised definitely gives me a little bit of pause, just the idea. So somebody could effectively kind of decide what's out of scope, what's in scope. We're not going to have anything about brown dogs in, in, in the learning of the AI. So brown dogs will never exist um, in the learning process. Do, am I overstating that or yeah, that's, oversimplifying that's, that? No, that's right. That's right. I mean, the supervised learning is more like, uh, here's a picture of a brown dog and the, the, uh, let's say the algorithm thought that was a cat. And then you would then tell it, no, this is actually a dog. And the algorithm was, would learn from what you tell it that, oh, it's a dog. Uh, and the unsupervised one is where it's just, you got a bunch of dogs and cats and they'll just start to render, you know, sort of using, uh, mathematical weights to figure out which ones are dogs and which ones are cats based on their features. And what and the deep learning is basically it'll go into the pixels and kind of start to figure out different pixel values and come up with a probability estimate of like whether it's more likely to be a dog or a cat. Um, and, and let me just add one other thing. Like, yeah, please. What's really interesting is that they apply the same uh, same idea to language. And this is why we have these natural language processing like chat GPT. So they sort of use the, these, uh, you know, sort of just uh, based on uh, the, you know, all the different data, uh, the computer can kind of predict which word is likely to happen, you know, come up next. Say you put in a string, the, you know, the, the brown dog jump over the, you know, and then it's going to kind of predict a oh, fence, you know, or something like that. Um, and so, uh, and the, all that is based on algorithms, and it kind of just learn uh, learn on its own uh, based on the data that, that it sees. So, I, I recall reading an article like maybe a couple of weeks ago that there were some prediction errors with uh, with um, uh, with with certain like tumor with predicting whether someone has a tumor, and they saw that the tumors there was a picture of of a of a ruler and a thumb. Uh, next to it. So it started to predict that wherever there was a ruler and a measurement that there could be a tumor. And that's maybe that's the early learning sort of, you know, difficulties and we'll get beyond that. But that's what seemed to give quite a few people pause of, boy, there's, they're making these kind of very basic errors that a human would never make. But is, is that, um, is that sort of just like early learning problems that will be sorted out? Or is that potentially a long-term dilemma that, that we might see? That's actually a long-term dilemma. It's a very serious problem. It's called a generative adversarial attack. And 
what's happening is that you know current AIs, at least with machine learning, it does something called associative learning. So it's kind of uh, you know it's what I was saying earlier. It's probabilistic. It's just trying to figure out what it's likely to be, but it doesn't really know what a dog is or what a cat is. It just sort of uses a bunch of pixel values, and you know if there are enough um, sort of tails or sort of no shapes, then it sort of says it's a dog, but it doesn't know what a dog is. And so the problem with that is you can trick it just like the way you're saying. And so sometimes it'll uh, maybe the way it figures out it's a dog is is because of you know um, you know some other features that are completely irrelevant. And so there are evidence where there's something called the one pixel attack where you can take a picture, you can take a, you know, sort of, uh, let, let's say there's a picture of a panda, and you just take one pixel away, and it'll, uh, the AI will think that it's a given with 99% like sort of confidence that it's a given, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very problematic in the case of things like cancer, right? Because you want this AI to kind of know what it's doing. And if it's sort of, if, if, if it can be tricked so easily, then we have to really worry about whether we should use it in healthcare mm -hmm. or use it in self-driving cars or use it in weapon technologies and so on and so forth. And that was, I presume that's now that perhaps is one of the issues, I guess it was a few years ago even, but perhaps recently where um, the Tesla was having the issue of not recognizing pedestrians um, and uh, in crosswalks and there was issues. so presumably that that was kind of the same type of issue if I exactly if I because it wasn't trained on enough data so there was one case where uh one guy uh, there was this guy who was walking across the street with a bike uh he was walking the bike um and there was just wasn't enough training data set of people walking the bike I mean there are plenty of data sets of maybe people on the bike biking you know <laughs> alongside uh cars but if you don't have enough data set, the algorithm can recognize that, you know, here's a different scenario because it doesn't understand what a bike is. And it just ran over, you know, like it caused an accident. Interesting. It sounds like it almost kind of reduces many things to the common denominators that if something's more exotic or not seen as often that it may end up falling, it almost goes extinct as far yeah. as the AI is concerned. Maybe I'm yeah. overstating that though. Yeah, no. And so right now, a lot of AI, researchers are trying to do something called one-shot learning where they can, because we can just learn. We can, you know, like once we learn what a bike is, then we can figure out sort of different things about a bike, including just a person walking with a bike, right? Um, and, um, you know, right now there are attempts to try to make algorithms smarter, uh, but we might, you know, like I, I, you know, I said that this was a long-term problem because this associative learning uh, fundamentally doesn't learn about like causal relationships. Um, and so a lot of uh, uh, AI researchers are saying now that we need the next uh, frontier for AI is for it to learn causal relationships. So we need to have some sort of causal learning uh, process for AI. You know, I have to say, Matthew, for someone who is a philosopher and ethicist, you sound like you have a pretty good handle on the technology, but maybe, oh. um, so, I'm, well, let me bring it back to a few ethical yeah. technology questions for yeah. you. Um, so first things first, something that recently that popped in the news about, uh, maybe it was a week or so ago, that the Commerce Department um, asked for public input, which I thought was interesting. And they said they want to make AI systems, I'm going to read this here, legal, effective, ethical, safe, and otherwise trustworthy, not too ambitious. Um, <laughs> the department said they're seeking feedback of audits or assessments that should be required before any company brings out new AI tools. And it's, I know that's not associated with that moratorium um, sort of request from those 1,100 uh, experts and technologists. It feels like this is like an early overture for regulatory oversight. What, what's your reaction from an ethical standpoint, um, but also even a pragmatic standpoint? What does that mean? Is that important? Is that is it an overreach? What, what's your, your reaction to that? Um, so I think it's a great idea. So there, you know, two, there are different schools of thought. So there's something called the West Coast uh, sort of theory where uh, people think, you know, just uh, we should be laissez faire, let uh, market forces, you know, no regulations. And then when there, there's a problem, we'll fix it. Right. And that approach has gotten us 
Tesla cars that have hit people, you know, sort of uh, just run over people uh, and, and things like that. And I think there's a different approach. It's the East Coast approach where it's more regulatory. It's kind of like the FDA, the way we regulate medicine. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there are a bunch of, there are institutional review boards where you, uh, you know, from the beginning of the research to all the way to its deployment, there are, you know, people looking over to make sure that it's safe for people. Um, and I think that uh, that approach seems like a really good idea, especially if the technology is going to be used in, for example, healthcare, right? When it's dealing with human subjects, you definitely want to make sure you have that kind of, you know, oversight, uh, because otherwise you could harm a lot of people. Now, recently I posted something and, uh, and, a, and a gentleman who's a very, very knowledgeable and involved in the space of artificial intelligence said, we have to stop worrying and trying to put our foot on the brake. I'm going to paraphrase. We, we can't put our foot on the brake. We have to keep letting progress moving forward. And it's a mistake um, or it may be ill-advised to just sit here and worry and discuss and debate in a circular fashion. Um, how do you react to that? Is that... Is he more about progress? Is that should we just be pushing forward more in the West Coast philosophy? Yeah, um, your thoughts about that? Yeah, so there are people who I uh, I call them sort of techno optimists. They think, hey, you know, technology is going to solve all the ills of the world, and we should just you know full steam ahead. And there are also techno pessimists who think, you know, the you know the world's going to end. We we see some of that. The people who you know the moratorium is. Is kind of you know the six months moratorium is kind of uh, fueled by people who think you know this is going to kill us all, right? I think that um, I'm more of a techno realist, and what that means is you know I think we need to you know these are technologies that can benefit us, but they can also harm us. So we need to be much more deliberative. We need to regulate them, and you you know we need to figure out a, a good path forward where we can have both innovation. And uh, you know safety and sort of like uh, and we've done that in other areas. So take uh, new drugs, novel discoveries of drugs. We've been able to do that. We have processes for that, and some of that those processes can be ported over uh, to this area as, as well. So I'm not as pessimistic as the techno pessimist, and but I'm also I also don't think that we should just sort of full steam ahead and just no regulation, unfettered access. Um, and so on and so forth. I feel like the techno realist must live somewhere in the Midwest, like Illinois or Indiana, <laughs> somewhere in the middle of the country. I like that term, a techno realist. Um, a couple of things I'm just going to note for folks who are listening in and chopping at the bit. They're thinking, I have a lot of questions. Dan's not getting to the ones I want to hear. Um, put those questions and chat them in. We're going to get to them in ooh, just a just a handful of minutes, but I'm going to Kind of, uh, kind of control the mic for a little bit longer because I have a lot more to ask Matthew, but I promise you will have a chance to have your say. Um, coming to this point about being a techno realist, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you are a mid-sized to a larger company and you've just been tasked with coming up with an AI strategy or coming up with an, in an approach with, um, with a, you know, a new technology in your organization, and you're not sure how to approach it, where does the the ethical framework fit in is it coming at the very end like we did all the work let's now pressure test it is it the very beginning is it all throughout and what type of practices might you suggest for kind of an everyday guy like me who might be asked to do this yeah um so i'm on a couple boards uh of like companies where i help them think about ethics and one of the things that i try to say is try to think about ethics right from the get-go um because you know uh, otherwise, you might end up spending uh, millions of dollars or even billions and then find out that, you know, it's not going to meet ethical requirements and you have to, you know, sort of throw away the whole project. It's much better to kind of be thinking about those issues from the, uh, issues from the start. And I'll just give an example where uh, thinking about the ethics can really help a company. So, uh, you know, right now we've been talking about chat GPTs and it's been so successful. But I think one of the reasons why OpenAI has been so successful is because it was thinking about ethics from the start. Um, and why do I say that? So if you just think about uh, natural language uh, models, are have they, they, they have existed, and many, many companies uh, have uh, had it. 
Um, so if you remember uh, Microsoft a couple of years ago, they had a chatbot called Pay, and that you know they, when they released it, uh, um, you know after a you know a couple of days, it was sort of spewing out all these racist things, uh, and so they had to shut it down. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I think that what OpenAI did was different, which is they uh, first of all they were thinking about they were thinking about racist, sexist language, inappropriate language, inappropriate actions, and so on and so forth. And you can just tell that they created modules where when people ask inappropriate things or unethical things, it got sort of uh, they blocked it, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was a team that was thinking about these uh, different types of things. Um, and that's why I think they were able to get such a, you know, sort of a huge uptake uh, by the public because, you know, they were able to kind of uh, make sure that the chatbots stay within the confines of ethics. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. Not that I've tried putting anything inappropriate in chat GPT, but I have heard rumor that if you ask inappropriate questions, it'll kind of push things out of bounds, which is, which is really interesting. Um, Kind of a little bit uh, connected to this. One of the stories that hit the news wires uh, about a week or two ago also, uh, I saw it in USA Today, was about a sexual harassment or a purported sexual harassment scandal. A uh, gentleman who's a law professor at George Washington um, was accused of, a, of, a, of you, know, um, you know, inappropriately touching somebody on a trip to Alaska and it hit the news and he had never been to Alaska. He had never been on a, a student trip. He didn't, the, the article that was referenced didn't actually exist. It referenced a Washington Post article. So he wasn't particularly amused by this to say the least, but it, it really kind of, for me, brought an important question is, can you hold open AI accountable for what a chat bot says? I mean, they're gonna say, look, look, we, we trained it. It's an unfortunate error. Um, you know, how do you handle these situations from both a legal and an ethical standpoint? Because there will be more of these and there's more stories for sure that I'm not reciting. How do they handle it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, the chatbots, uh, ChatGPT and GPT-4 and other technologies like it, they, they're sort of, you know, as I was saying, it, it's sort of, it's, it's generative AI. So it's trying to generate, uh, it's trying to predict what the next word will be. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't hew to reality, uh, you know, sort of, it just sort of thinks, oh, the, you know, probably this next word will be X, right? Um, and so it's going to make up a lot of things. And that's one of the challenges. So, you know, between chat GPT-3 and GPT-4, GPT-4 already has a uh, a less hallucination. So it doesn't, you know, that's a technical term. You know, they, there's actually uh, a setting there where you can kind of uh, increase hallucination if you want to like it to write poetry or something like that, or re reduce it, you know, decrease it so that it's more factual. Um, and so, um, I, you know, and, but fundamentally it's not gonna, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's still sort of generative AI. So it's gonna make up stuff. Um, and so what should, should we hold open AI accountable? It's hard to say. So like take defamation, for example, like mm -hmm. just, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I, you know, I understand defamation requires that you intentionally uh, say something false about somebody. It's not clear that um, chat GPT has intentions, uh, that it's right. intentionally doing this, right? So, and then that open AI intentionally put that uh, information in about this professor and so on and so forth. So probably legally, it's it, you know you probably couldn't get like it probably wouldn't fl like fly to sort of uh, have like a defamation lawsuit. Um, should we hold OpenAI accountable? I think they want to hold themselves accountable, right? So they it's in their interest to make sure that when information like that about real people are out. Uh, it's as accurate as possible. And that's sort of, I take it that's the goal of ChatGPT-5 is to, you know, have even fewer hallucinations. Um, and it, it's come up, it's not just sort of like these cases, but also um, citations. They, they're sort of, you put in people, they'll say, hey, so-and-so published this paper. And it's totally not true. It's completely fabricated, right? Um, and um, so that, that problem is going to persist as long as we use uh, something like uh, this sort of machine learning that I was talking about, where it's just kind of learning on its own, 
and it doesn't really understand, you know, uh, who Dan is or who who I am, and you know, and things like that. So, yeah, very very interesting. I I love the term hallucinating. <laughs> it, it's got a very interesting kind of illusionary reference to that. But but if you want to hallucinate more, we can give something to the machine to see how it handles it. But um, Awesome. I, I, I'm going to turn to some questions that have come up and I'll just note there are some questions that were sent direct to me. Um, so thank you for sending those, but there are also some that have been put in LinkedIn. I'll start with one of the first ones that was inserted into to LinkedIn. Um, a question was, can you explain how a single pixel can accomplish what you described? Is it a specific location on or of the pixel? So maybe a little technical question. We'll, uh, we'll test your technical acumen out, Matthew. Sure. So the single pixel attack is just uh, they figured out that um, it, it's not a it's not a single pixel in a specific location on a picture. So if you were trying to do this at home, it's not quite like that. But they were able to figure out that um, um, the algorithm seems to be finding certain pixels more salient in their way of predicting whether something is something like whether this is a picture of a panda right um and such that if they were to remove that pixel then all of a sudden their confidence in this being a panda drops right so and it's really weird because if you just look at that pixel it's just like a black dot or a white mm -hmm. dot uh, for you like the human eyes uh and but for the algorithm it seems to be so important and then there, let me just mention that there's a, another one where they did something like a fil like a, a filter thing where um, uh, they took about 400 pixels uh, just randomly from a picture, just kind of, they just changed it. But for, for a human eye, so if you look at two pictures, like it's basically you see two picture, uh, two pandas, right? Um, and they look exactly the same. You can't even see it. It's like 400 pixels out of a million. They kind of mm. alter the values, right? So to a human eye, you can't see anything. But again, they can get the computer, the algorithm to classify it wrongly, just based on just put, putting this filter in. And what it's, uh, you know, again, the idea is the same. It's like, uh, uh, because of the deep learning, it's lo looking at different things, kind of like the example that you used, Dan, is looking at, and it's finding things like, Oh, there's a ruler, therefore it's cancer, you know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Uh, whereas we would, of course, wouldn't think ruler, therefore cancer, but that's what the algorithm is doing. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll follow up the, one of the, the questions that had been asked me earlier, I'm going to paraphrase it a bit, um, is about academic dishonesty in AI. Um, my oldest daughter is a student at uh, Indiana University at the Kelly School. And um, one of the things that they were already grappling with and asking students to try to solve is how do we ensure that students don't abuse um, ChatGPT to write their term papers, to answer their questions for essays. It completely denudes the value of kind of academic integrity. And I, I wonder um, what, what may be some of the things that, that have already been proposed uh, to be able to reduce that. It's, you wanna use the tool that's incredibly powerful. It's sort of like ignoring a calculator and saying, nope, still got to use your abacus, um, but because it's cheating. How do you evolve with the technology knowing that students and professors also will be using it? Yeah, so I think the, one of the things I do in my classrooms is to uh, kind of explain why pleasure, uh, uh, pleasurism is bad for, for the student, right? And so uh, NYU is a very expensive institution, it's a private school. So I sort of, I tell them, you know, you're spending all this money and then you're getting the computer to write your essays. Like the essay is your opportunity to really develop your thinking as a, you know, your thoughts and in your ideas as a thinker, right? And if you just use ChatGPT, you're depriving yourself of that, you know, opportunity. You might as well just save your money, you know, and, and, and not do that, right? <laughs> Um, and this is sort of a rare opportunity where you can kind of uh, have this, you know, this time to think about these ideas, develop them, and then really work them through. The way to use ChatGPT is maybe it can help you uh, generate some ideas. Like, let's say, you know, like you're, you're, you're having a writer's block and then, you know, uh, but don't use it to write the whole essay. Like, mm -hmm. sort of get, get some ideas and then 
from there on, like start writing yourself, like, you know, develop your own thoughts. The problem with ChatGPT is once you start to replace the logical reasoning, the critical thinking part, then you, you're really depriving yourself of something very important. I, I'll, I'll just quick follow up on that is, uh, yeah. you know, my, my hypothesis has always been that our, our memory is, is being deprived when we overly rely on search engines. And there is some research of the being some hippocampal effects. Um, but, but moving to this next step, is there a potential risk that it, it could actually affect our critical reasoning ability long term? if we end up relying primarily on chat GPT or other AI technologies, or am I overreaching in my, uh, my, my hypothesis? Yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't think so. I don't think you're overreaching at all. I do think that if you uh, just use chat GPT to do the thinking for you, then, you know, I think the thinking is a muscle and uh, you know, this is what I tell my students, um, uh, you know, you have to practice, you have to keep working at it. Um, and, the more you do, the better you get at doing it, at being able to recognize different problems, being able to think through them, being able to break them down. All this analysis, they're very important for whether you're in the academia or in business and so on and so forth. Um, and you lose that ability uh, you know, if you don't use it. And so I, I do think that that's a real danger. And so it's something that we wanna be care, like we wanna be aware. Yeah, so somebody else asked another question. Going, I guess people enjoy the, the reference to hallucinating um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the hallucination problem is fascinating, as they said. It seems that it can be used for beneficial purposes, but where is the line and where could it be harmful? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, I think I mentioned where it might be beneficial if you're writing fiction where, you know, facts don't matter as much or poetry or things like that then a bit of hallucination could be good, right? Sort of uh, opens up creativity. It's like algorithms on LSD or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you need factual things and, uh, it, and this, the, the AI is hallucinating that you could uh, uh, produce things that are just factually wrong and those could have consequences, right? Um, yeah, yeah, like as in the case that you're talking about uh, with respect to sexual harassment, right? You could end up accusing somebody, uh, as, you know, like spreading rumors that oh, so and so engaged in sexual harassment when it did not happen at all, you know. So, I had, I had one more question, and then we're going to go to our final round. It's, I mean, time's flying, but the, I have to ask this one. Somebody had asked this question before we even did this, and they they emailed it over to me when they said they were, uh, they were going to be attending. And uh, they asked a question about China specifically. Ooh. So there are a lot of dimensions with China, but one of the things that was brought up, and I'm going to read this back to their email they sent me, which was um, that China's proposed new rules to ensure generative AI sticks to socialist values. Um, they, you know, after Alibaba rolled out ChatGPT, that came out from the government. What does that mean? I, I, <laughs> how do you get AI to stick to specific values? I mean, you talked about supervised versus unsupervised, but there's implications of, of the overly controlling. Will China be able to do that? And could anybody do that? Could, you know, a right wing movement say we're not going to hear about anything, you know, that references Democrats or, or, you know, progressive politics. Can you actually control for certain ethical norms? Yeah. I think uh, if China were to try to do that, I, I, uh, it, they, it would face a dilemma. So either, it, so, you know, algorithms are trained on data. So if you just restrict uh, the data set to socialist values, say, right, um, then it's uh, maybe you can create an algorithm that does that, but it's not gonna be very useful because there's so many other things out in the world. And if you just, if you're trying to, you know, restrict it only to that, then it can learn a bunch of like basically, you know, what the rest of the world is doing, you know. Uh, uh, but if you open it up, then it's going to learn a bunch of other values, right? And it's not going to, it's going to be very hard for 
uh, it, you know, sort of even the engineers, because of the black box problem, even the engineers to figure out, hey, which part is the socialist one and which part is the non-socialist <laughs> one? So right. we can remember because there are going to be billions of nodes in there, and it's almost impossible. Like once you open it up, and so uh, maybe it comes in degrees. Maybe they can have a bit more socialist value, but they're not going to be able to be able to eliminate it once they open it up. So it sounds like and, it sounds like ChatGPT in general. Yeah. poses a significant dilemma to any authoritarian regime that's trying to yeah. control information. No, exactly. Exactly. It's going to just, uh, uh, and then th there's also the user inputs, right? So ChatGPT is also learning from when users put in things. So let's say you create something with socialist values and it's completely isolated and contained, but when users start to use it and they put in non-socialist values, it's going to learn other things unless uh -huh. you again restrict it like don't learn from the users but then it becomes very not very useful so interesting wow yeah. all right well thank you for that that insight on that because that that's a complex issue i'm interested to see how it unravels over the next yeah. the next six months to a year or more we'll have to do another session matthew so we can find out what happens okay. next which reminds me we do have a part two of our of our session here together and part two I've stolen from ABC. It's called What Would You Do? Now, if you've seen the show before, uh, I think Jonathan Kunonis is the host or he's been one of the hosts. And the idea behind it is you're presented a moral dilemma. And in that moral dilemma, you have to decide in the moment, what would you do? And uh, I've concocted several sort of scenarios based on real things that, that I've come across. I haven't shared it with Matthew, so he hasn't, doesn't have a scripture written. He's going to refer to it. And I'm going to ask you, Matthew, if you don't mind, to give it like maybe a minute, half a minute or so reflection and, and, uh, and an answer of what would you do or how would you approach it? So you ready to do it? Let's go. <laughs> right, let's do it. All right, I'll give you one hint. The first thing we're going to start with is workplace related. So I have a few scenarios related to the workplace, which a lot of folks who are listening, they work day jobs, they work in companies, and they may be or have already experienced these. So the first one I have, your company requires that you have to get vaccinated for the next pandemic strain, whatever that may be. Um, but an employee decides to refuse to be vaccinated due to personal beliefs or medical reasons. You are that HR person or an organization person responsible for this program. What do you do? What would you do if that yeah. was the situation? So it depends on the pandemic. It depends on the virus. Um, and it all, so I, and then it depends on the medical uh, exception or the personal beliefs. So if, um, if it's a valid medical reason, and let's say the personal belief is a religious one, uh, I think typically their religious exemptions, um, you know, that would be valid. Um, but, you know, it, uh, it also depends on the virus. If the virus is very virulent and can kill a lot of people uh, and the vaccine can kind of stop it on, the, on its track, then, you know, you might think that uh, even if you want to accommodate the religious exemption, maybe you require the person to work from home. Uh, mm -hmm. Luckily, now we can all use Zoom <laughs> and things like that. So maybe it's a bit easier, you know, in this day and age uh, for that type of accommodation. Uh, but certainly, uh, you should allow some accommodation depending on the reasons. Uh, but at the same time, you have to uh, make sure that it's safe for the workers, the people who do come in. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, you know, you, it's part of your responsibility to everybody in the company. So. I'm going to guess you probably have grappled with this one a few times over the past couple of years. But, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, I've got another one. Let's let, we're going to bring the stakes up even higher, Matthew. So something that people are grappling with right now, um, you're hired by a company during COVID and it was your understanding when you were hired, it was a mutual understanding that your job would be a hundred percent virtual all on zoom, but the CEO had a change of heart evil hearted person that he was. <laughs> and they decided all employees have to come to the office at least three days a week now. What would you do if you are working for that company uh, or advising that company, let's say? What yeah. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. So th this is a, a bit of a legal issue. It depends on what's in your contract, right? If your contract says specifically that you you don't have to come in at all, I think you'll have a legal basis. Uh, but uh, independent of that, it depends. Like you know, if everybody's coming in. Um, and you're, you know, let's say the office is in New York and you're still working from Florida, right? It, you know, it might become a real hassle for you, you, you know, sort of where everybody's coming in, you're losing that social capital, right? Uh, and so you're not getting the most out of your job if everybody's coming in uh, and things like that. And so at some point, maybe you need to think about getting a new job, <laughs> you know, uh, because, just because, uh, uh, you know, the pandemic was a very exceptional, you know, situation, and you can see why during, you know, like during the pandemic, you know, people would want to be, try to be maximally flexible, but now that it's uh, sort of, we're on the tail end of it, uh, you can see why policies might change. So. And, and is there any ethical quandary that that CEO or leadership team would face in doing an about face as a hire people, or how, how would you view the evaluating that decision if you're a company or the CEO, as many yeah, probably are right now. Yeah, that, that's a great question. It depends on what was communicated. If the CEO says, look, uh, we're hiring you, it's going to be 100% uh, virtual now and forever, right? Uh, then That's the very CEO, categorical. Yeah, that would be lying, right? The CEO would have lied, would have backtracked on uh, his or her words and that would be you know even if there's no that would be unethical even if there's no it wasn't written in contract right now if the ceo was uh, said something like hey we're during the pandemic so you can kind of work uh virtual uh for now uh so now that uh, that's a conditional right so it assumes that you know once the pandemic's over we might change our policies Right. So it depends uh, on specifically what was communicated, I think. Mm -hmm. Words matter. Words <laughs> really matter. All right. I have a, another scenario a little bit further out uh, into the ether, but not so far out. Um, a new robotic technology that your company is testing um, has been shown to be able to eliminate thousands of operators at your company. And you personally have been asked to conduct the test that do the final comparison of workforce to the robots. Um, and you decide that you don't want to do that test. Mm -hmm. What would you do if you are that person being asked to do that analysis? Is there any ethical quandary of effectively doing an analysis or study that's going to potentially eliminate all of these jobs? Yeah, so I think uh, companies have an obligation to their workers. So uh, to, uh, you know, if you're going to, lay people off i think uh ethically speaking at least you should kind of try to give them a heads up right uh you know if you foresee that it's inevitable inev that you're going to be deploying this technology it's going to save the company millions of dollars and so on and so forth you're going to want to give them a heads up so that they can uh find new jobs you maybe try to help them uh acquire new skills and so on and so forth I know companies don't often do that for cost reasons and things like that, but I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, especially with these workers who have done a lot of work for you, I feel like uh, it's the, it would be the right thing to do for companies to uh, uh, help these workers transition to a different uh, employment. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take you out that word. Now, if there are a lot of workplace stuff, I'm going to shift. We got a few more scenarios for you. Uh -huh. um, you've done a lot of work in the space of neuroscience, and we've mm -hmm. only just briefly alluded to it. So there is an area that uh, you're probably familiar with, BCIs, or brain-computer interfaces, which maybe I'll ask you even to describe what that is um, to, to, the group, to the group here. Um, let me give you the scenario, and then maybe you can backtrack and share a little perspective. Sure. A company's developing a new campaign for a product, and their research partner has let them know that they have the ability to use BCI to measure consumer responses to advertisements and taglines and such to develop better campaigns. Is it morally ethical? Uh, and what would you do if a research partner said, I can read other people's minds to help you develop a better marketing campaign? So let me pause. What is BCI and what would you do if yeah. you were presented that? Yeah, great question. So uh, BCIs are sort of brain-computer interface uh, 
uh, for short. And um, there are different uh, versions of it. There's something there's you know from the very non-invasive to the very invasive. So the non-invasive ones are things like EEG, so electroencephalography, uh, where you kind of put it on your scalp and it kind of measures uh, uh, things from your scalp to something where you open it up, it's like at the surface uh, of your scalp, to something called uh, deep brain simulation, where you insert an electrode into your mm. brain, uh, deep into your scalp. And in fact, we even use deep uh, brain simulation for conditions like Parkinson's, depression, and so on and so forth. So there are about 100,000 people who have used that. Uh, and the US government, for example, is really interested in uh, DBS, so deep brain simulation, because there are a lot of soldiers who are coming back uh, from war with post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's an idea that maybe PTSD can be, uh, you can use DBS to uh, sort of affect the amygdala. So the theory is that PTSD is the result of hyperactivity in the amygdala, which is your, it's sort of the emotional center of your brain. And there's like excessive emotions from the trauma. And so if you disrupt that, you can kind of affect PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, now back to your question, Dan. So uh, there's actually, there are actually all these devices, EEG devices that people are already deploying where they, um, you know, uh, precisely for advertising reasons. So mm -hmm. IKEA, for example, has a headset where, uh, you know, there are like research groups where they put this headset on and they get them to walk through sort of like sort of look at di different IKEA furnitures and things like that. And it's for advertising purposes, exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and, you know, they monitor sort of like they can monitor different types of waves in the brain and so on and so forth. Um, can it read your mind? Um, EEG is kind of not very accurate, but it can do something like reading your mind already. So there's uh, there's a there was actually a study that showed that you can easy use EEG to figure out someone's pin codes, like potentially use you know. Wow. Uh, you know, so they're getting them to play a game and then sort of using EEG, they flash different numbers like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, right? And then on the basis of that, certain numbers will show up more strongly on EEG. And the idea being that if it shows up more strongly, it's probably one of the codes that you are associated with, wow. like that you care more about, right? So if your pin code is zero, nine, seven, eight, these are not my pin codes, by the way, <laughs> but you know, like then, and it shows up, you know, more strongly on the the, the brain, and so they they can already do that. They're they're so it's it's very uh, premature, but it's it's sort of on the way. Like the research is being done in that area. And it sounds like there's a need for ethical frameworks around this because it seems like it'd be very easily abused. Yeah. So uh, there's a, well, you know, we talked about China and um, like different places. There, uh, imagine just workplace workforces requiring you to wear EGs. And they're monitoring your uh, productivity. Are you surfing the internet? Are you paying attention? And so on and so forth, right? Uh, they uh, another thing that's being deployed right now is um, sort of truck drivers, right? Are they falling asleep, right? You can mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, use these devices to track REM, you know, sleep cycle and things like that. And so uh, this is something that we need to start to uh, think about and. Uh, really think about human rights and sort of, you know, workers' rights and things like that. You know, is this too invasive? You know, because before the brain at least was one area where it's shielded from like, like sort of intrusion and sort of interference. But now companies can actually get into it. And so we need to, you know, like that, that's, that's actually something I'm writing about uh, in my book on the future brain. So I'll, I'm going to ask one more brain related scenario for you where we're running short on time, but I, I'd be remiss if I don't ask this question. Um, let's say, imagine there's a dating website that's proposed a new way for people to get over their past bad relationships experiences. Um, so you could try to meet Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, whoever you're after. Um, and they offer free erasure of really bad date experiences. What would you do if they had proposed that as an investor to you? Is that is there is this an ethical overreach? Is this an ethical compromise to be able to even to give people the option to erase bad memories? Uh -huh. Yeah, this is like the movie, uh, my, one of my favorite movies, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, 
And uh, in fact, the technology, some of the technologies are there. Uh, there's something called propranolol, and you know, I mentioned PTSD and you know, soldiers coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, propranolol is a beta blocker. And um, if you give, if you take beta blockers, uh, propranolol early enough, you can actually uh, uh, cause the memory not to get stored into long-term memory. So our memories have mm -hmm. to be consolidated, right? There's a consolidation stage once you experience something traumatic. But if you use propranolol, it dampens that emotional salience of that experience, and then it doesn't get consolidated. The, the downside of propranolol is that you have to take it almost within 24 hours. Um, but uh, propranolol is something that you can actually take, and people have used that as therapy uh, for to kind of address uh, things like PTSD. Um, like, and it's it, it sort of it, it's a kind of memory erasure in the sense that you just don't remember it, or it's you don't remember it, it becomes more hazy that particular experience. There, I'll just add that there are more high tech things that are coming online. Mm -hmm. uh, so the memory thing is really interesting because uh, there's the consolidation stage, but there's also the reconsolidation stage, which is whenever you think about a memory, you have to put it back together again, right? And to putting that memory uh, back together requires certain proteins. So uh, a colleague of mine here at NYU, Andre Fenton, is actually working on that. And he discovered that there's a, something called PKM data. It's like a protein where if you uh, stop that protein from being able to exp uh, you know, express itself, then certain memories don't get reconsolidated. In that way, you can actually erase, cause a memory to kind of go completely out. Uh, and then there's one other thing, which is you know, what the... Uh, MIT, there's a group at MIT, they're using something called optogenetics, which is light, using light, and they genetically modify certain mice, and they were able to insert false memories into these mice. Uh, mm. You know, so the mice who have never, so uh, the way it works is, uh, you know, they shock the foot of a mouse, and they could have figure out the neurons, the, you know, where the neurons were activated, right? Uh, and then they take uh, and then they took the uh, mice who were never sh uh, been never been shocked, never been in that location, and then they activated the same neural network in that location, and then they had the freezing behavior exactly as if they had been shocked. Um, wow. Yeah, which is uh, it's like inception. So how do you and and how do you keep up from an ethical standpoint with these these technology? I mean, this is it's a revelation to hear yeah. about this. It's also frightening and intriguing. And it just gets me thinking, like, how do you keep up with it? And, and maybe this yeah. is even in the last you know, few minutes that we have, when you think about you know, advice for, for any you know, upstart new venture or scientist or researcher that's developing something or a, any corporate sort of innovator mm -hmm. that's got something that has, you know, that kind of plays in the margins, if you will, um, what, what guidance or recommendation tips would you give them so that they yeah. don't end up kind of running afoul? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And there are different ways to think about the ethics of this thing. The way I like to do it is a uh, sort of human-centered approach. It's based on human rights. Uh, uh, you know, individuals, all of us have rights. And if you start with there and you think about technology, you go, go from there, you can actually figure out a, a, a lot of things become clearer and easier, right? How do we make sure that certain people's rights are protected, promoted, not undermined, and so on and so forth, right? And just using that framework uh, with human rights in mind can get us very far. Let, let me give one example. So uh, right now, uh, a lot of companies, you know, there, there's like a big data problem, like all the companies with AI, they need to collect a lot of information, right? Um, so the 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 prevailing thought is, hey, if someone you know says consents consents to uh, giving their data away, then we can use it for whatever we want, right? The human rights approach says not so fast, right? You need to make sure that uh, first of all, are you using this this data in a way that's going to promote human rights, promote this individual's human rights, and so on and so forth, right? And so that makes it that. It, that puts the onus on the company, the researchers to really think through the ethics of it, right? We can't just sort of, oh, now we can use this data. So we're going to use this data to discriminate against this person, create facial recognition. It's not going to make the person's, you know, undermine the person's rights and so on and so forth. No, you know, like, you know, the human rights approach will stop, like, we'll say, hey, we got to think about that. And maybe those are bad ideas. So. Great, great input. 
We yeah. are out of time. I, I wish we could just talk for another couple hours and maybe we can, <laughs> but uh, you all won't be able to listen to it. But Matthew, amazing insight, examples, um, and, and just stories bringing this to life. Um, first of all, big thank you to you for joining and sharing your wisdom. And thank you for all of our deliberate innovators out there listening. We will have our next episode coming up in May. We're going to have a double episode as we're going to talk more about patient advocacy and patient engagement. But again, big thank you to Matthew and also for all the great insight and wisdom. So join us for our next deliberate way where we will be looking at the patient perspective and the patient centricity. So thanks for tuning in. We will see you next time. That's Thank all. You.